Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Vanessa Venturini. I am a staff person here at URI Cooperative Extension. I have the pleasure of being the program leader for the URI Master Gardener program. There is a Master Gardener program in every single state, plus England and Canada and South Korea interesting fact. So we are international. And so if um, you are not joining us from Rhode Island, we encourage you to reach out to your local cooperative extension. But what's so beautiful is that we're all part of this land grant university system. And so we are excited to reach out here to Joseph Gores, who is a professor at University of Vermont, which is our sister land grant university in Vermont. And not only that, we always say you can have one degree of separation from anyone from Rhode Island, and Joseph is a former professor. In fact, he was my professor. So I went to URI for environmental science and management, and I had Joseph for soil science, and it was a very memorable class. So <laughs> glad to have you. <laughs> okay, um, so do you mind just hitting the next slide? Not at all. Beautiful. So we're going to do a few opening slides and then we will get started with the main event. So as I mentioned, we are all part of the Cooperative Extension Land Grant University system. Not only do we teach about things like jumping worms, but we have other areas of focus. We have a water quality group. We have energy literacy classes. We have nutrition classes and 4-H and food recovery courses and land stewardship and forestry. So we encourage you to come to Cooperative Extension in whatever state you're in for science-based information. Next slide, please. And we're really that community engagement arm of the whole land-grant university system. And so we wanted to make sure that if you're in Rhode Island, you know that there are many resources for you through the Master Gardener program in addition to these types of programs. We've got lots of cool fact sheets like when to plant your seedlings, which is really in seeds, which is really relevant right now as people are doing seed starting. We even have a URI gardening and environmental hotline. You can email us, you can call us five days a week, and there are real humans who will answer your question with science based information. Um, next slide, please. And we invite you to become a master gardener. They take these courses take place at different times, depending on the state or county that you live in. In Rhode Island, we're one big county, one small state, and we have one program that runs in the spring. And each year, applications are due November 1st. And um, this year, it'll be due November 1st, 24 for next year's class. And we encourage you to apply if you're interested in making a difference in your community and sharing good science-based information. Next slide. Okay, few little pieces of housekeeping are to please enter your questions in the Q&A box. So everybody can practice that right now. If you're just joining us, you can go to the bottom of your Zoom menu and click Q&A. And we'd love to know where you're joining us from as a first start. Um, we'll have time at the end for a few questions, probably not everyone's. We're so excited to be joined by 423 people. We did want to let you know that this session is being recorded, so you will be able to visit our Cooperative Extension YouTube page to find this later, and we'll email it out to you as well. You can also um, feel free to turn on closed captioning. So at the bottom, there's a little button that says show captions, and that'll give you um, automatic closed captioning. Next slide. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so now I am so excited to welcome Barbara Ray, who is the chair of our continuing education committee with the Master Gardener program. Thank you so much to Barbara for the phenomenal job she's done. She's one of our longest standing Master Gardeners and a lot sharper than me. <laughs> and uh, Barbara, we're so glad to have you here. Do you mind um, please introducing the speaker of the evening, Dr. Gores? It would be my pleasure. Thank you for joining us, Vanessa, and thank you, Dr. Gores. Um, I just want to, uh, dumping worms are such a hot topic. We can't believe it, but a thousand people signed up to listen to this talk tonight. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Professor Gores. Um, Vermont's economy depends on agriculture and thus soil is a central resource. His teaching and research connects ecosystem services with agricultural economics for the sustainability 
and prosperity of farms in Vermont. So all of your cooperative extensions in all of your states are working with the similar purpose. Uh, Dr. Gorich got his bachelor's degree and his PhD in physics um, at the Manchester Institute of Science and Technology for his PhD. And he got a master's from URI in natural resources science. So for many years now, Dr. Goris has been studying all things soil. And unfortunately, one of those new things in the soil is jumping worms. So we'll turn it over to you, Professor, for your interesting talk on jumping worms. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Vanessa. And uh, I'm connected to both of those by one degree of separation. Uh, uh, Barbara was my uh, my um, lab safety officer while I was at, at uh, URI. And Vanessa, as she said, she, she was one of my students. So with that, uh, uh, we're going to go to... Uh, to talk about jumping worms. And uh, I'm hoping that I can put a few things across to you that are frequently asked questions. So hopefully we can we can uh, lower the demand for the, the hotline. <laughs> um, every year in, here in Vermont, we, we get hundreds of, of calls. Of the, I mean, the Master Gardener hotline gets it. It's, it's, it's my firewall to uh, to all the, the poor people that, that are reporting that they have jumping worms. But nonetheless, uh, I get I get quite a few questions myself, um, and I'm hoping that uh, I can answer them in this in this talk. Not all of them, I'm sure. I'm sure you have more questions. But what, what you see here um, on, on the slide is, is, a, is a picture of two jumping worms, and I want to point out a couple of things on that image right away. So um, one of the, the the marks uh, that would identify <clears throat> uh, these worms as jumping worms is this thing called a clitellum. This is this lighter band that goes around the uh, the, the body of of the of the earthworm, uh, close relatively close to the nose, about 14, 15 segments to uh, away from the nose. Um, and the, if you want to identify jumping worms, you want to look at that these this band goes all the way around the worm. You can see how it kind of disappears underneath there and underneath the, the body, but it goes all the way around to the other side. So that's really important, a uh, really important uh, uh, identification mark. Uh, really, uh, when you look at, at jumping worms, uh, make sure you see that. Or if you look at earthworms, if you don't see that, you probably don't have jumping worms. The, the trouble is that um, you only see that in the summer. So when they're uh, reproductively mature, and so that will start sometime, I would say mid-June in gardens, uh, beginning of July in, in forests, maybe later. So you have to wait quite a bit before you you see this and can identify the worms by this by this particular char character. So a little bit about earthworm invasion invasions in North America. Um, there was a first wave of invasions uh, that those are earthworms from europe uh, that came with with some of the the boats that uh, took settlers across across the ocean and that might have been like early 1600s maybe a little later um but then there was a second wave um and that second wave came from from asia um and that might have been for jumping worms for the, the types of worms that that i study uh it would would have been in the late 1800s so mid mid to late 1800s. So why was that second wave so late? Right. So a lot of worms, a lot of invasive species move with with commerce. Our worms, I'm calling them my worms or our worms. But what I really mean are jumping worms. Uh, the, the ones, the species that we're concerned with came from Japan and uh, and Korea. And uh, most of you probably know that Japan was economically isolated until 1853. And then uh, soon after, 10 years later, uh, the first jumping worms were actually found on the west coast of the United States. Um, on the east coast, that was a little later. So uh, that was maybe the beginning of the last century, so not early 1900s. Uh, and uh, it's been associated with the cherry blossom gifts from Japan. And that is pure speculation, but it makes sense. <laughs> uh, 
All right, so if you look at the distribution of, uh, so oftentimes I get this question, well, how come these worms can survive here? You know, they're, they're coming from tropical lands. Um, well, that's not in, entirely true. Japan basically has the same climate zones that we have in the, in, on, the, on the east coast of, of the United States. And it, it corresponds also, uh, the habitat in Japan and in, in the United States also corresponds in terms of latitude. Right, so if you look here, this is uh, for one of the species, Amynthus agrestis, it goes all the way from, from here near Sapporo, all the way down uh, to the Ryukyu Islands. Uh, and that goes from 30 degrees north to 45 degrees north. And if you look at the expansion the expansion of, of these worms, the range of these worms in, in, in the US, it's the same latitude range. So we shouldn't be surprised that they're here and that they can survive here as well. Uh, so what is the present distribution? Uh, we already seen that they are all, all the way down to Florida here in the Northeast. Uh, you know, when we look at Northeast, they're pretty much in every Northeastern state. Um, and they have recently been discovered in, in Canada as well. Uh, to one of the hotspots, the really big hotspots is around Toronto and Niagara Falls. And then there's uh, some, some reports out of Quebec, very few reports out of Quebec. Um, and... Uh, very few reports out of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia as well. Uh, what the picture here on, on the on the right hand side shows you uh, the backyard of of a house uh, that is known as Ground Zero in New Brunswick. This is like two years ago they found uh, they found these worms here, and uh, I visited there. It's a really interesting site, um, and every year they're kind of moving down this lawn a little bit further. So what are jumping worms? Well, uh, I mentioned that they, they arrived on the East Coast um, of North America at the beginning of the 20th century, probably with, with the uh, cherry blossoms and other uh, imports of uh, horticultural goods. Um, they've, they've recently reported from, from Eastern Canada, as I mentioned, but very, very few reports. Um, horticulture is one of those places where there might uh, acclimatized to to new new places, um, so uh, when when a when a new new species arrives in new habitat, it might take them a while to uh, to become acclimatized. And and gardens and horticult horticultural outfits might be really really good because they provide a lot of things that these worms need, like uh, mulch that might also regulate the temperature. Uh, but it's also food. Uh, also, there's also more moisture because you irrigate your your plants um, uh, and so on. So horticulture is, is just a great breeding ground for these these worms. Um, they are regulated in in several U.S. states, including New York, um, not in, not in Vermont, uh, not in most of the other states, new, new, not not in any of the New England states. Uh, they're regarded as invasive species, uh, but they're not regulated um, in any way. Uh, they modify the soil and create loose casting layers. So you see the casting layer right here. It looks a little bit like uh, uh, some people call it looks like dark hamburger, ground hamburger. Um, some other people might call it uh, coffee grounds. Um, again, very prominent uh, on on this worm is is the is the clitellum that goes all the way around around that worm. Uh, they they are annual worms, so they are they die in probably November, first frosts in November, uh, most of them die, and then some of them might survive into, into December. The last couple of years, we've seen them survive into January because we had pretty warm warm weather. Um, uh, but but eventually they die, you know, before, before the, new, um, the new worms hatch. During the winter time, they survive as cocoons, um, and uh, the cocoons are really good at... Uh, um, and allowing the worms to uh, allow the, the the embryos to survive uh, frost and drought, um, and when you if you want to control them, you need to do both. You need to control the worms and you need to control the cocoons. And this makes makes control really difficult because the cocoons are survival structures. They're not they're not they're there to protect the worms, protect the the, the population, I guess. Uh, so do you really have them? This is, uh, at this time of year, uh, so March, beginning of April, 
I get a lot of pictures from from folks that say, "Can you identify these these worms for me?" Because I think I have I have jumping worms. So there's, there's so much hype about jumping worms that if you see a worm nowadays, all worms are jumping worms. Of course, that is not true. And oftentimes, I can just say, "Well, that's not a jumping worm." How do I know that? Right. So um, one reason why I know this is if I look at my own garden, I have jumping worms too. Um, if I find a I find a worm that's really active, then that's most likely a jumping worm. The European worms are not all that active. Um, there are some worms that are act there's some there's another species that might be pretty active and you probably can tell by its name. It's the red wiggler. So wiggling sounds like active. Um, but it's also known as tiger worm. It's got it's got stripes and you'll see a picture of one of those a little later. Uh, so what you see now might be actually a tiger worm. Um, for the jumping worms, you won't see any juveniles until May. The juveniles are there as of April, but they're not big enough that you would notice them. You can see them if you know what they look like. You'll find you'll find a, a bunch of them, but um, but they're so small that you just don't notice them. Um, so most of the worm, most of the worms that you see now are European worms. So in the summer, as I mentioned, you can use the clitellum as, as one of the characters by which you identify these worms. And then there's another way of potentially doing this right from, from hatchling size, and that's the bristles that go around, around the body of, of the jumping worms. They're arranged in a, in a particular way, and you, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. And in order to, do, in order to, in order to look at the bristles, you just need a hand lens. Right, so ring around the collar. I already mentioned this. Uh, it goes all the way around. It's slightly offset in color from from the rest of the the body, and it can be anything from white to like a light pink color. So, uh, how can you tell jumping worms from from other worms? Uh, so, in in many many cases, where you look at a European earthworm, you have a more raised clitellum, and it doesn't go all the way around uh, around the the worm. So if it doesn't go all the way around around the, the body of the worm, it's not a jumping worm. Here's an example of a jumping worm. It's got that clitellum again. Oftentimes, it's got a shiny surface. Um, and here, it actually sits on its castings. So the castings are also a dead giveaway in terms of uh, whether you have jumping worms or not. And then uh, the red wiggler, right? So the compost, the typical composting worm, uh, it's got different names in in Turkey, they're called California worms because they think they came from California uh, for some reason. Uh, but also, it's also known as as yellow tail uh, because it's got a yellow, uh, got a slightly yellow tail. You can see you can see it here. It's almost like you know, as, as though it was a rattlesnake type thing. Um, of course, a lot uh, smaller and not as dangerous. And then when they stretch, they have these yellow stripes in between the uh, the segments all all along the Along, all along the, the length of the, the body. Most, but it's most prominent at the tail end and at the at the head end of, of the worm. Uh, and so you have to wait until they stretch. That's when, when it's most visible. So if you don't have a, a an adult yet, so you see see a worm that uh, is not that doesn't have a clitellum yet, then you you can use a hand lens to identify the arrangements of the the arrangement of the setae, so the bristles that make those worms move, uh, and this is what it looks like in on a jumping worm. There's a ton of bristles all around the worm, um, on on top of each of the uh, the segments, so lots of bristles, and the other ones might look look like this. You might have paired paired bristles that are uh, widely spaced. Uh, narrow spacings between the, the paired bristles or wider spaced, or you have e almost equally spaced bristles, uh, but very few of them. And then for jumping worms, there's a lot of bristles all the way around, almost equally spaced uh, around the perimeter of a segment. So another thing that, that you might consider is where do you find them so they like moisture they like organic matter so in wet areas and areas that have been mulched or have received other kinds of organic uh, amendments like uh, compost uh, leaf mulch 
uh, that kind of stuff, even even wood, woody mulch. Um, that's where you you if you look around and you have these worms, that's probably most likely where you see them. They also like to be in untilled soil, so tilling uh, kind of disrupts their habitat, which is the casting layer that they create at the top. Um, so raised beds, perennial beds, lawns, uh, those kinds of places are probably where most we most likely find find a good good number of them. They will eventually move into the tilled areas as well because you're not constantly tilling tilling the soil. So uh, don't be disappointed that if you till uh, and you you find find some some jumping worm in there, and that's the reason why is that you probably have them elsewhere on the property, and so they move move into the tilled areas once the tillage is done. Uh, in terms of their pH range, uh, 4.5 to 8, so uh, from from relatively acidic all the way to an alkaline soil, uh, they, they can handle that. And it can be any soil. So some people say well, that they can't take sand or they can't be in clay, it's too hard. Uh, I, we have seen them in, in any, any textured soil, sand, silt, or clay. So you don't have much clay in Rhode Island. Uh, I know you have more, more silty and sandy soils there for sure they'll be they, they can survive in that so one of the the tricks is might be that you don't want to feed them if you keep adding organic matter then you are encouraging them uh, you 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 promoting their their uh, reproduction so i think the first thing that that i should say now that i'm i've kind of dealt with all the the, the things uh that have to do with these worms the identification um I should say that it is always cheaper to invest in preventing them coming onto the property or into a region than to try and remedy it, right? So here's a, a typical graph um, that shows shows an invasion. So at the beginning, so this, this stippled line here is the, the number of uh, sightings or the number or the area that's occupied by the invasive species. And so in the beginning, there's none, right? So this is this is the time when you want to prevent. There's no no sightings, or none of the area in in your region is is occupied. Then you want to you want to invest in prevention. How, like for for the emerald ash borer or or some other wood dwelling pests, you try to stop firewood from moving one from one place to another. So that'll be prevention. Um, for for you, it might mean that you don't buy um, uh, don't you don't buy plants with soil or you don't you don't buy any kind of uh, compost um, to stop to stop that prevention uh, to stop stop the invasion <laughs> sorry um if you get a little bit further along where where suddenly you you see some some of them you can you can try eradication so nova scotia is somewhere in between the area where you want to prevent because there were very, very few uh, sightings and eradication. So where, where they're seen, you should try and er eradicate. Uh, and then as we move, al move along, uh, you get to a place where you want to try containment. You try to kind of quarantine places. And, and it has been, that has been uh, suggested for, for horticulture. If they have them, they should be quarantined and that has not really stuck anywhere. So, uh, it's still safe to be horticulturalist and sell your sell your goods, um, but containment would be you know a quarantine on some place, and that that's that becomes a lot more expensive, right? So this this curve is not just the area occupied uh, by by the invasive species, but it's also the cost of management. It shows it it goes with this curve as as you get more and more area invaded, the cost of management keeps going up and up and up. So in Vermont, we are somewhere between the containment and 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 the long term control stage. So we have to start thinking about you know how can we contain it, contain these worms. Uh, containment might might in, involve eradication as well, and definitely prevention. You know, containment in one place means prevention in another place. Uh, if you look at the cost ratios for every dollar that you you put into prevention. You you basically gain a hundred dollars of opportunity of opportunity, right? So uh, if the worms get there, then you would have to pay a hundred hundred times more to control them. Eradication for every dollar you spend, you have a good chance, you know, you, that you get twenty five dollars back on the investment. And as you get to containment, it's a one to one ratio. 
and economic and then economic return on long-term control is 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 worse. Um, so how do they spread? So one one of the things that seem to have spread them in in places like uh, Vermont is leaf mulch. So mulch from um, mulch from uh, that you get might might get from a transfer station uh, because they have a lot of leaf leaves uh, that are delivered in in uh, in in the autumn. Uh, but those leaves might actually be full of jumping worms because people rake the leaves. They also rake, rake some of the jumping worms. And so once once that is is uh, at the dump, uh, then likely uh, they're spreading in other into other pieces of maybe uncontaminated uh, bags of um, of leaf mulch. And from there it goes to the next next home when people pick up some leaf mulch to to amend their gardens. Uh, and so here's a here's a, a web page that you might want to look at. Uh, you know, they're basically saying we like our leaf mulch because we can do something with that on our own garden. So in order to contain, to prevent and and contain uh, the threat, why don't you use it in your own garden rather than uh, trying to take it to a place where uh, where the worms can spread from, with the leaf mulch moving elsewhere. This is the backyard of my garden, and you can you know you notice maybe here's here's a irrigation line, and it's nice and wet around it, except for up here. And what you see there are castings of 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 jumping worms. So they they dry things that allows the castings allow things to dry out faster, which accounts for some of the problems that that you see, um, especially drought drought symptoms that you can see uh, in in some gardens that have been invaded. So um, before I say something about horticultural products being being things being uh, vectors of of this invasion invasion, I should also say horticulture is a really important industry, and it needs to be supported, right? So it, in some ways, you know, on the one hand, you say I, I have to say, well, you know, be careful what you buy. On the other hand, I say, well, you know, I don't really want to have these places go out of business. Uh, so uh, potted plants frequently. It doesn't matter that there is that there is a um, some land, landscape fabric underneath there. Uh, they crawl right across that and get into these into the bottom of these uh, uh, these pots, and you buy them with with a plant. Uh, and then there's of course uh, uh, compost, and it 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 appears to me that it is not where the compost is produced necessarily, but it might be, so the comp where the compost is produced, they, they are now taking really good care of what they take in as feedstock. And they're also taking care of uh, getting that uh, compost um, really hot uh, and to turn it when it needs to be turned so that other other places in the compost pile that are, were cooler are now hot heating up. Um, uh, the problem is when when that when compost is moved from 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 the composter to maybe a, res, a resale area, either a nursery or land, a landscape company, um, that's where maybe some invasion of that compost happens because uh, at the nursery or the landscape company uh, um, there's there's jumping worms, and then that when you buy when you buy from from them, then you probably also get some uh, some of these worms. This is not true for all places, but for some cases, certainly that is is the case. Um, so the other image here is, uh, shows you the cocoons. They're pretty small, so each one of these cocoons is maybe an eighth of an inch uh, in size. Uh, they look a little bit like uh, soil soil particles, so they're really difficult to see. Unless you extract them from the soil by washing washing that soil very carefully through sieves, uh, but uh, if even if you don't see any worms in the compost, you might have these cocoons in them, which then hatch the following year. So at the other end of that stick is is the forest products industry, uh, and they might you know I'm surprised that they have not really spoken up much about this problem, but the the uh, the number of saplings. Um, the number of saplings, and I, I have to, I never mind. So, the number of saplings that uh, maple saplings that uh, um, that are in areas that with jumping worms is very low. It's like 
0.5 of a sapling per square meter. Um, this next one here is, is for uh, night crawlers. So the second largest peak uh, bar here is for night crawlers. So you get some like two and a half to three saplings per square meter on average. And then for no earthworms, it's the last peak here, you get six or more uh, saplings per square meter. So in some ways, the, the worms are preventing the, um, or the, they're creating conditions where uh, where the saplings are are not being successful. And there's different reasons for them, reasons for that. It might be for jumping worms, it might have something to do with the casting layer, but it could also be simply be that when uh, there's earthworm invasions, you lose a lot of the understory, uh, the, the seed bank is lost, um, and therefore some of the smaller plants that ordinarily are forage for deer um, are also lost, which means that the deer will start foraging whatever is left, and that tends to be more of the woody species. Um, and that, that reduces the regeneration of, of maple uh, in, in New England forests. Um, so they can also move around under their own steam. And here's a here's an example of that. So here's a, a garden and here's a sort of a, a map of how many cocoons there are adjacent to the garden. So the source was the garden and the forest received some of the worms. And there's a couple of peaks here and they, they correspond to some... Uh, 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 resource hotspots like a uh, bunch of bunch of uh, fallen wood uh, or a depression with lots of um, lots of leaf litter in them, and so the worms moved quite a ways, but then they kind of stopped in places where where they find the resources. And then towards the end of this, about uh, 120 meters, 360 feet from from the garden, there's hardly any uh, cocoons there because the worms are not moving that much further out. So it's a it's a long it's a long process for them to move from one place to another under their own steam. They love to move with people and they also love to move with flowing water, right? So um, here's an example from near um, Montpellier or Montpellier, as we say in Vermont, um, forest, uh, maple forest. This is sort of how many jumping worms there are. There's a ton of them here, like hundreds or hundreds per square meter. Um, uh, then there's an image of uh, of that forest after a big rainstorm. This was the July deluge that we had here, <clears throat> and uh, you notice that there's areas with lots and of, lots of leaf litter, and that's the lighter brown areas, and then some areas that are like a darker brown. And so these darker brown areas are essentially channels that the water carved into the casting layer. The castings are very loose; they're they're easily easily eroded for that reason. Uh, and when they erode it, they, they can move with that, that, that flowing water a long distance. And so the, the casting layer also includes worms. As you can see here, the worms are at the surface. So they would move also down, downhill and, uh, and, and cocoons if, if this happened uh, when, when these worms were already producing cocoons or the cocoons from the previous year. Um, and so in this case, uh, the erosion was downhill uh, towards the north north branch of the uh, Winooski River. And from there, uh, these worms might have gone anywhere downstream. So flowing water is, is also a really important uh, way of moving these things around. What are the impacts? So, so this is, uh, there's not been very, very many studies on the impacts of these worms. We know, uh, we know a few things, but uh, really, ideally, we would like to get a, a big grant or a big donation from from a private uh, private source uh, to for us to look more into these these impacts. Right. So the impact starts basically at with the soil with the soil modification that they cause. Right. So jumping worms uh, are only one type of earthworm that causes um, modifications of the soil surface. The other one are European earthworms, um, and you, you th here 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 are three different views of a uh, of the top of the top soil of of a forested um, area. On the left hand side, uh, this one here, you see that there is this really spongy layer that's when you walk on it, it gives you a little bit of a bounce. Um, 
but it's it's very uh, very highly aerated. Water moves freely through that. Uh, you've got lots of roots uh, in there, lots of fungi in there. Uh, there's a whole network of um, of biology that that uh, decomposes and delivers nutrients to to trees and shrubs and and smaller things. Um, so ephemerals will also root in this. It's also a seed bank. So it's it's a seed bank. It's a germination medium, and it's it's sort of a uh, so the 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 forest version of of a potting mix, right? So things grow really well in that. So when you have European earthworms, which is sort of adjacent here on the right hand side, uh, they consume a lot of that and they mix some of it with the soil below. So then this very spongy layer becomes a more compacted layer uh, that is no longer a good seed bank, nor a good germination medium, um, nor does water flow easily easily through that layer. So the, the whole ecosystem is changed simply by, by the earthworms being there. And you might say, why is that not a problem in Europe? Uh, well, in Europe, they've been there around for longer. The, the, the forest had several thousand years to co-evolve with the earthworms. Um, then for for the uh, peritomoid or jumping worms, uh, for that invasion, we get these loose castings. And that can be as thick as 10 centimeters. This one here ten, uh, happened to be about five centimeters thick. Um, and that causes a different kind of problem. So it, it is very loose. It is highly porous. So it, 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 it has a similar, I'm not sure whether it's exactly the same hydrology as, as this uh, spongy duff layer in the undisturbed soil. Uh, so water moves through it pretty freely. Uh, but the other thing that, that you don't see any, any roots or you don't see any, any fungi in there. So this is no longer an organic soil. It's, it's a mineral soil and, and it doesn't have the same kind of tie into the, into the ecosystem as, as this very organic or horizon uh, in the undisturbed soil. So with that, after after this this happens, after these changes are made, you get um, what they call an ecological cascade, which basically means uh, it's a, a bunch of dominoes that are falling over, right? So, so here's the earthworm is, in, is invading in this diagram. It changes the soil structure, that changes the density of that soil, it changes the organic, the, the amount of organic matter that's in that soil. And that will have then consequences for the cycling of, of nutrients in that soil, for uh, also for the microbial community, which then again again has, has an effect on the nutrient cycling. Uh, and that will then change the habitat for, for, for plants, for the plant community. Uh, and, but also for anything, any of the smaller critters um, up to salamanders that that are in that for on that forest floor, they will all have a changed living room uh, in which they have to survive. And um, there's all sorts of things happen because of the invasion that uh, involves predator prey relationships uh, at a, at a very small level, like not not the. Uh, not the wolf and, and the hound or something, or the wolf and whatever the wolf, <laughs> uh, the wolf and the baby, but more with uh, uh, the the predators, maybe some beetle predators or, or some nematodes that that prey on uh, on other creatures in in the soil. So that will change, and that again will have an effect on how the nutrients are being being cycled, and then. Those things are called micro cascades, so they happen in place. But there's also macro cascades, and 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 you are most of you who are here listening to to me are part of that cascade, right? You're here for a reason. You want to know more about these these creatures that that make your life miserable, uh, and so uh, yeah, effect on uh, human psyche, right? So I, okay, you think Joseph is crazy, but there's been a study that that has shown that people that find out about having jumping worms in their garden that they go through stages of anger and grief and so it has an effect on human human health uh, mental health um, even though we might laugh about it right but it's a real effect but there's other things like this it it facilitates other invasive species because the soil the soil is, is different now uh, wildlife habitat changes 
maybe forest and, and crop product productivity change. Uh, soil, soil and water quality might change. So soil quality, yes. Water quality, we don't know about, uh, even though we can speculate and we're probably right there's a change. But definitely climate change and CO2 uh, losses. Um, and uh, some people say it also affects uh, wind and fire uh, regimes in forests. So there's a lot of different uh, different effects at the larger scale of society. But so if if we kind of sum this up for the forest uh, on the left hand side, you you see a, a forest that that is uh, relatively healthy. Um, it doesn't have any earthworms in it. You have lots and lots of regeneration of maple trees, and you have a bunch of other plants in here. Uh, this forest is a sink for pollutants. This this forest is still able to absorb nutrients and maybe other pollutants. Um, now, if you take that away and you turn this into a, a jumping worm devastated desert, it's not strong words, uh, but uh, you know what I mean. So a place where maybe the understory is highly disturbed uh, or absent, then you have these events where uh, where erosion happens. And so that does that sediment that that is running down that hill is a source of pollutants because it it's high in nutrients and it might in the past have uh, have absorbed um, might have absorbed heavy metals or other pollutants that are now getting into a river. So the cumulative effect for, for forests is you lose the biodiversity that the understory usually has. Uh, you lose soil because of erosion, and with that erosion goes uh, goes water pollution. Uh, particularly in this case, when we talk about erosion, we're talking about surface water uh, water um, degradation. Uh, there's a reduction in maple and and other uh, canopy species uh, regeneration. There's carbon loss, and uh, then I already mentioned water pollution. Uh, so, what's the impact on horticultural crops? So, really good question. Uh, my postdoc, Mariam Nuriain, uh, who took, took a, a PhD with me, uh, and she's been behind a lot of uh, the integrated pest management strategies that, that uh, we talk about uh, in, in these kind of seminars, um, webinars. Um, but she's also, last year, she did this really cool experiment where she, she grew a bunch of different plants in... in uh, in small pots with earthworms, with jumping worms in them. And there were some that responded positively. You had these, on, these onions were, were huge. They, they worked really well. And there were some others that didn't, that, that, that died. And so one of the, the, the areas of research that we are advancing um, is uh, to find out what plants will survive, what plants will, will be able to grow in the castings. Right. So here's an example of, of, uh, of a comparison between um, cilantro plugs that were put into fresh potting mix and cilantro plugs that were put into, uh, into potting mix that was modified by jumping worms. And this is about around about the same time. Um, the, the plugs that were put into the jumping worm soil uh, all died. Uh, they didn't grow very, very fast and eventually they died. Whereas the the ones that went into the fresh potting mix uh, thrived, uh, and the the uh, symptoms that we saw were nutrient deficiencies, but also um, drought. So drought symptoms is is probably the most uh, reported symptom of jumping worm damage, and it may not be that they eat the roots and thereby reduce the amount of the amount of water that can be taken up by the by by the plants. It is more likely that it's um, it's that the structure of the soil is is different, uh, and water moves through that soil more freely, and therefore uh, it doesn't retain retain the water so well. Um, in pots uh, where where this is frequently seen, uh, when you pull when you pull the, the the plant out, first of all the plant comes out really easily, and secondly, um, oftentimes the roots at the bottom are, are dangling dangling in sort of air because all the all the stuff that all the the potting mix that was around those roots have been has had been uh, consumed by by the jumping worms. Other things that have been been uh, observed was uh, faster decomposition of woody mulch. 
uh, loose connection of roots with soil so that you know some some plants are more likely to fall over um, a loss of micro mycorrhizae and root connections so mycorrhizae are a part of the, the part of a symbiotic or the, they are symbiotic with the plants and they provide phosphorus to the plant that is difficult for the plant to get otherwise um, but overall we really know very little systematic not we have very little systematic knowledge about about this and again it is a question of uh the willingness of uh federal agencies to come up with money for this kind of research uh, which is you know from from a high impact uh probably not all that important uh, you know if you if you can fund corn for fuel or something like that that has a much bigger societal impact at least in in the minds of of the uh of other scientists who review your proposals. So difficult to get, get the funding for this kind of work. Okay, so a little bit about the biology of the jumping worms. Um, so the, the time course of their, of their annual life cycle, and it's not really an annual life cycle. I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Uh, but typically, so if you didn't know anything at all about, about these, these worms and their cocoons, you'd say, Okay, I, I find the first hatchlings sometime uh, in April and May, and they're juveniles until they're and until you get into June. There's this huge peak, this huge peak of juveniles. You can get like six hundred per square meter, or or, or about seventy five per square foot. And then you see the first adults somewhere between July and August. This is in the forest, so you probably see them earlier in uh, in your garden. And then uh, you might see the last juvenile sometime in September, then peak adults in mid-September to beginning of October, and then sometime in in uh, in December, early December, you probably see the last adults, except for the last two years when we saw them into January. Um, and sometime around uh, February, we see the most cocoons. And that's because the, the adults were really busy from first adult to all the way to the last adult uh, making cocoons. So the reason why I'm saying this is this is not just an annual life cycle is because some of the cocoons live survive longer than one year. So there might be uh, there might be you know 20 percent, 30 percent of them that, that are still active or alive the following the year after so two years after they uh, they've been produced or maybe even three years after. We don't know exactly how long, but uh, they last several seasons. And so that makes it that makes this also a really interesting uh, organism because it is difficult to model. So for for scientists that is a challenge and interesting, right? So uh, for you as a garden owner, you say, "Oh, I wish that you could just come up with some kind of pixie dust that kills it all." Uh, but um, but it, it's a longer term process for sure. Uh, the hidden life cycle of jumping with other cocoon. So this. If I start over here with the with the juvenile or the hatchlings, uh, again sometime in April, juveniles May June, adults July August September October November, cocoons, um, cocoons, actually as they start being produced as soon as an, as there's an adult in in July and August, uh, and then the the uh, the embryos go through different stages as well. So stage one is you see the albumin, but you don't see see any 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 action in there yet? Stage two is a little bit a bit further along. Uh, you you see you see sort of a, a worm that's kind of short and squat. Uh, the first the first segmentation is seen in stage three. Then you have something that is relatively almost looks like a like a hatchling. And finally, there is a hatchling. Um, these two stages, stage four and five, uh, we call them ready to hatch, uh, and and that's kind of important. But so this looks very linear. But it's not linear at all. So um, it's not as though the hatchlings hatch, juveniles develop, adults develop, they make cocoons. The cocoons are are all around this cycle. They're always there. Um, so this is what what jumping worms might adult jumping worms might look like. So July, very few, August, some more, September, there's a maximum, then End of September here in, in Vermont, we have the first frosts. <clears throat> so then the, you have fewer of them. They don't really like frost when they're when they're adults um, or when they're in, in the in their worm form. Uh, October less, November less, and then December you see very few of them. Or you, in some years they're all dead. Um, so in terms of 
the cocoon development, though, uh, this is what we see. We have so we had five stages, and we we sort of um, we sort of turn, turned them into two stages. So the, the early early stages is the is this, the black part of the bar. The ready to hatch is the orange bar, and then there's dead dead cocoons. There's always some dead cocoons, um, but you notice that uh, uh, the ready to hatch ones. Um, are really high in in June um, and and July, and then uh, they become fewer and fewer. But even in February, you have for Amynthus agrestis, one of the worms, uh, you have uh, ready to hatch um, cocoons, right? So all those all through the year, you have ready to hatch cocoons. So they can at any point, if there is the right temperature and moisture cue, uh, they might hatch, and then you have a new then you think you have a new clutch of, of earthworms, but they might actually be two years old. So there, there, is, a, there is hope. Um, you see a, a bronze by Leo Leone um, here in, uh, in, in, it was in Tuscany, not in Vermont, uh, but you notice there's these lizards that are feeding on earthworms. And that's oftentimes the question, you know, is, is there a way of, of finding the right kind of predator and bringing it over so that, that we can rid of, get rid of these, these worms? Well, we tried biological, chemical, and physical ways of, uh, of controlling them. And so I, I'll go through some of those control methods. So the first thing is stop the spread, right? So that, that is about prevention. And that's some, some physical, uh, economic ways of dealing with it, like the way they spread is through horticultural products and compost, uh, and maybe woody and, woody and leaf mulch, uh, likely also any kind of topsoil you buy in, or or loom, as you say, it, as you call it in in, uh, in Vermont, um, sorry, in, in, in Rhode Island, of course, uh, but not all sources are contaminated. So if you kind of cut out some of, some of this, you know, you buy fewer horticultural products, or you you um, you get less compost. Uh, you don't use leaf mulch. Then maybe you have a better better chance. But it could also be that that during a big storm you you get a whole bunch of these worms from your neighbor if the neighbor's garden is is also is uphill from you uh, and is contaminated. And so runoff and erosion really important things. Or uh, if you're living living on a river, then maybe uh, sometimes you might get. Uh, you might get one or two worms that that uh, crawl crawl on on land from the river onto your property. So what can you do? So um, one of the one of the things that you might be involved in that might spread these worms, you might you know plant plant sales and and plant exchanges. Um, and I get a lot of questions about that. Uh, so uh, plant clubs say, how how can I assure that I'm not spreading the worms that are on my property to to people that I want to, uh, you know, make happy with with my my favorite plants. And so the 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 thing is, you could root wash the plants. That seems to be like a lot of work, but when you do it, it's it's kind of zenny. It's it's pretty cool. You need two buckets. One is of a very dirty bucket, and one is of a less dirty bucket. You fill them with water. Actually, you might have a have a third bucket as well uh, with a little bit of soapy water in it, and that's for the worms that you might find. Right, so uh, you swish the plant uh, in the first bucket a little bit, the, the roots anyway. Uh, that takes off a lot of the lot of the soil. You might massage mis massage the roots a little bit so that more soil comes off. And then, in order for you to to see better what's going on, you can take them to, over to the second bucket that's got cleaner cleaner water in it. Uh, and you get probably can get rid of the rest of the soil, and then you basically inspect inspect the uh, the plants, uh, the plant roots, and see whether you see any of the cocoons. And they're small, uh, but they're pretty much round, so spherical. Uh, they tend to be gray to brown. Uh, and once you've seen one of them, you will see a lot of them. Uh, maybe not in your washed roots. Hopefully, all the all the cocoons and the worms are in that in that water. If you see any any worms, uh, put them into the soapy water that will kill them. And by the way, once once they're dead, uh, you don't have to worry about any kind of eggs that might be over might be left in 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 the the worm. Once they're dead, they're dead. They will not 
you will not get new worms out of dead worms. So you can you can put them on your compost pile. Um, okay, that's so that's this slide, and you want to aim for something like this where you don't see anything, any kind of uh, soil around the roots uh, anymore at all. And then you then you can you can exchange those or sell them at a at the seedling sale. Uh, and oftentimes bare root planting uh, has other benefits. Uh, you know the the plants take better. Um, if you have plants that were pot bound before, uh, then you can un unkink and un unravel unravel that pot bound uh, root ball and and it'll make a better plant. But then I'd, I'd like you to also look at plants a little bit differently, you know, so still stop the spread, plant sales, plant exchanges. Well, think about plants a little bit different. Like plants are not just, just the leaves and the stems and the roots, but it could also be the seed, right? So if you're planning on a on a plant sale or a, a plant exchange, why don't you exchange roots? Uh, sorry, roots. <laughs> uh, why don't you exchange the, the, the seeds? And that's done around the country there's seed exchanges right so uh, but you could maybe replace replace your plant sale with seed seed sales or the, your plant um, plant exchanges with seed exchanges um, you can also use uh, rooted cuttings so you can, you can take a cutting if you have a woody bush or something something that that actually roots or a begonia or something like that all these things that that you can stick in water and they will root uh, so that that might be one way of doing this, and you you bring them to to your uh, plant exchange in in moist paper towels, right? So that might work pretty well. Um, if you if you feel like it, you might want to uh, put things back into into potting soil that's really clean. That way, you know there is no no uh, worms in that. Um, uh, you might have to take them down the cellar for with grow lights or something like that for a couple of days until until the plant sale happens. Um, but you definitely want to store them away from from where you you suspect there are uh, jumping worms. Um, so yard and food waste waste management, do it on your own property. So uh, try and compost it on your property because if you if you take some of your yard waste away uh, to somebody to somewhere else, then it's likely, and, and you have worms, then those worms will move. Uh, food waste, you don't probably don't have to worry about too much. Uh, there's no worms in food food waste. Um, you could also shred your leaf litter with a mulching mower and and use that as input into uh, into your own garden as a um, as a as a, a mulch and, and nutrient source for the for the the lawn, or you can use it as browns in your compost. Um, so don't take it to the dump. Um, try and, and do things uh, in your own garden. And then there was actually a really cool paper in Nature recently about how uh, gardening uh, is in terms of greenhouse gases is so much less efficient as conventional agriculture and producing these greenhouse gases and that's because we bring in so many things into our own garden uh, that we have more co2 uh, and, and other gases evolve and so one of the things that that would be important to to stop that is to uh, to recycle to recycle yard waste in your own in your own in your in your own yard um, I think that's kind of a cool thing So what else can you do in terms of trying to stop the spread? So you could buy different kinds of organic amendments where you are sure that they're not, not infested, right? So buy your compost from a reputable commercial composter directly. I think that's my, my best bet. Um, the heat treatment does kill the cocoons and the worms. It gets hot enough for that. Um, most composters, commercial composters are aware of the jumping worm issue. And they will try and and prevent their piles from becoming invaded. Um, they do have quality control. There are some people that even count count cocoons in their compost, and you know, hopefully, don't find any. Uh, but there's always a, a small risk of of infestation. But it's a smaller risk than if you were to buy the compost 
uh, at a municipal dump, or, because there's some some of those composts around as well. They don't usually get as hot, and they don't get the same kind of um, expert treatment. Uh, that might differ from from uh, municipality to municipality. Uh, and if you buy buy uh, compost that was produced by by reputable composters from a different sales point, uh, then that might that might also be uh, invaded. So be careful. So the other thing that that I like uh, is solarization, right? So solarization is basically the heating of of uh, compost and other earth materials in in the sun, right? And what all you need to do is uh, you need to wrap, you need to make a, a sandwich <laughs> where the, the the plastic drop cloth. Uh, I, I recommend that uh, is is uh, is is the bread and the and the the compost or the mulch or the soil that you're buying in is sort of the the butter and, and the cheese, right? So the way you do this is, this is important that you put some kind of insulating layer on, on the soil. So anything that, that feels warm to the touch is likely a good thermal insulator. Uh, and so I've, I've used cardboard, uh, corrugated cardboard, the kind of cardboard that comes with uh, Amazon boxes uh, that seems to work. Uh, styrofoam works. Uh, you know any kind of uh, uh, heat insulating material, so the the pink stuff or the the blue stuff will work. Um, but also maybe some some wood might work as well. What's important for anything that will soak up water? Try and keep uh, keep the the cardboard and the uh, um, and the wood dry. It, it doesn't work really well. If it is, if it wet, if it gets uh, sorted up, so uh, put it in maybe big plastic bags or somehow prevent prevent the moisture of moving into it. So once you have that down, uh, you need to put a layer of this this plastic drop cloth or anything else. If you if you have um, old, if you have a, a like a high tunnel nearby and and they they uh, they take the and they re replace the. <laughs> <laughs> the cover, then you can use that kind of that kind of stuff as well. So the high tunnel plastic uh, sheeting um, that might work as well. So you put that down, then you spread your compost on top of of that first layer of, of this drop cloth, and uh, you don't want it to be thicker than eight inches. Um, uh, and then you place another layer on top, and you kind of wrap things up around uh, around the edges so that uh, you have the the top one. The, the top sheet kind of wrap underneath the, not far, but a little bit underneath the, the compost itself. And and then you you take the the ends of the plastic drop cloth up over the top of the uh, the other drop cloth. And I usually weight it down with, with any kind of weights that you have uh, so that, um, uh, that the heat stays in, it can't escape out of the edges. Uh, and then I'll, I leave it in the sun. Uh, and you want to basically start it in the sun, you, you, and you don't want any kind of gray days in between, right? So you want to look at the at the ten ten week this way the ten day uh, <clears throat> forecast, and find out whether there is a there's a bunch of sunny days ahead, and that's when you kind of set that up. I would guess that uh, if you do this in mid May, it will probably work if you have sunny days. Right, so what is what are the solarization temperatures that the compost needs to reach? So there's two numbers that have been shown to kill. Uh, excuse me. To kill uh, earthworms, earthworms and cocoons, jumping worms and cocoons. So the first number is 35 degrees Celsius, which is something like 95 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, and the other one is, uh, and that's where where adult worms die. And the other number is uh, 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's where the cocoons die. And that's been shown. So we're working on figuring out whether 35 degrees Celsius is also uh, good enough to kill the cocoons and and how long uh, how long the exposure has to be. So for 40 degrees, an hour of exposure is, is long enough. 
for 35 degrees, an hour was not long enough. We still had some live cocoons. And we are just right now, somebody is, is trying to do like a six hour experiment. And, and then if that doesn't work, then we'll, we'll take it up to, to higher, um, to longer, longer hours in, in the heat. So of course there's not enough sun right now, but we're gonna do this in an incubator um, to figure this out. So what you see here on, on this graph is, uh, it's a number of days, so days on the uh, days on the uh, on the x-axis. So it starts sometime in July, 184. I don't know. There was some something like the 16th of July or something. On the y-axis, you have temperature. So there's 50 degrees up here, um, and uh, just to make it easy to see, I uh, drew lines at 40 degrees. This is the, the purple line going through here. And I drew another line through here, the red line, horizontal red line is uh, at 35 degrees. So uh, if we want to be 100% sure that the worms die, you know, with our current knowledge of, of the, the kill temperatures, uh, then we want all of these curves, and I'll tell you what the curves are in a minute, to go above above 40, the 40 degree line. So these, these lines are essentially the, uh, the temperatures of one of those compost solarization sandwiches um, that are made up uh, at different depths. So the the orange is at but one at one uh, inch. The gray is at two and a half inches. The yellow at four. <clears throat> the blue at six, and the the brown at at eight inches. And that's the bottom. That was the up the bottom of that of that sandwich. And. Uh, you notice that after one day, you know the the one inch one goes up to sixty degrees just within a day. It was when went went through the roof, um, and uh, that after after two days, uh, the the bottom of the pile. So it's after three days, one, two, three. After three days, the bottom of the pile was was above uh, forty degrees, the kill temperature. Now, if if we were, if we could show that it, that 30, 35 degrees Celsius is good enough. Then, then two days in the sun is is enough to uh, to do this. And so you have about six hours or seven hours of temperatures above thirty five degrees. This this brown line here. Um, after two days, uh, so if you want to be sure that it works, then three days is probably a good a good number. The three days in the sun at um, uh, the, the the bottom of that eight inch pile will be hot enough to kill to would have the two have killed all the um the cocoons and you can do this with less success uh if you wanted to um uh, solarize soil so what what these farmers are doing at, right there is is uh they're rolling um fabric uh, this is this is actually fabric that goes over high tunnel. They had just changed the the plastic sheeting on that, and that they're, they're trying to do two things. One one they're collaborating with us on the jumping worm issue, but they also wanted to kill a, a cover seed, a, a cover a cover crop that they had seeded in there as well. So solarization will do that. For in terms of how effective this is to kill uh, earthworms, I don't I don't know because earthworms can escape only have to escape a small amount in the soil in order small small distance in the soil in order to escape the heat so uh for any kind of cocoons that that were within the top four inches they were probably all dead but the worms themselves would have probably escaped to lower depths but any any kind of any kind of uh um reduction in cocoons the number of cocoons in the soil uh will lower the number of worms that you see the following years. So more stop of the spread. Um, so one, there are some researchers that have tried uh, prairie wildflower mix in their backyards, and they swear that there was no earthworm, that got, there was no jumping worm getting into that into uh, the area that was seeded with that prairie mix. Um, this has to be, you know, of course, studied uh, with more. Um, with more uh, under more controlled conditions than somebody's backyard. So, uh, but that might be 
that might be one thing that 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 we can study uh you know what what does a very diverse plant community do does does a diverse plant community keep these these worms away and we do we don't know whether it's the plant community itself or whether there's individual species in that plant community that <clears throat> that would um uh would have like an, an allelopathic um effect on the worms so it's always good to follow basic invasive species rules when you want to contain the worms so in landscape and horticulture that might mean uh, clean your equipment when you move to work elsewhere don't dump horticultural waste in the woods that this happens a lot uh, so landscapers uh in some in some places where they have like a woodland right next door they just take take the the, the horticultural waste to the with the permission of of the owner into the woodlands and that might then just spread the worms into the woods um uh think about they have to think about you know how to manage waste on site so not dumping it but maybe also composting it uh they have to worry about moving earth materials so for example the, the nice thing that that Rhode Island um Rhode Island cons construction crews like to do is they scrape the topsoil off uh they take it somewhere and they put nails and teeth and shards into there and then they sell it back to somebody else um that might not be such a great idea if you want to contain the these these worms right uh don't move any kind of earth materials or rotten wood or something like that um and use compost from commercial composters sure nurseries uh you know some some of the the nurseries now pro uh, provide options like uh footbrush to clean shoes as as you move as you walk away um they do bare root sales and and some of them uh even uh even give you information about jumping worms and and tell them about what what they do so you have a choice um to buy or not to buy uh, or to to walk away better informed and then gardeners uh collect the worms when you when you're weeding collect the worms put them in a bucket of soapy water soap kills them <clears throat> prevent erosion from your garden so try try and keep keep some kind of cover on there um and then use any of the the, the methods that, that i'll be describing in a minute so we're getting to the eradication stage now um anything that eradicates can also help with prevention so <clears throat> i have to I have to say this so i'm not a certified pest applicator yet i'll take my exam my exams in April and in, in, in May. So I cannot really legally recommend anything to you uh, or advise you on, on what and how, uh, but you can consult somebody with a certification and, and talk to them, you know, uh, what is allowed, what's not allowed. Whatever you do, if you use anything, follow follow, follow the label. That's really there to protect, protect you, uh, protect your plants. And and prevents any kind of off off target effects. You don't want to kill uh, bees and bumblebees, right? When you are spraying something on on the soil. So, uh, with that disclaimer, I'm going to move on and and tell you a little bit about our our results. So uh, we've been working with something called an entomopathogenic fungus. So it's, that's a fungus that tends to kill um, insects. Uh, and there's one, there's a couple of them that also kill earthworms. We find out. So uh, one that we like to work with a lot is Boveria bassiana, and we grow it on millet. And when we're done, it looks like this. It's this, this white, this millet that's covered in this white fuzz. And it, and so we go in from like a, a, a formulation that is powdery to a formulation that is uh, um, more granular and it's easier to apply. The powder just blows away when once you have, have it in granular form, formulation, you can actually uh, spread it more easily <laughs> and um so excuse me i have to get a little more drink here <clears throat> uh uh we uh in this case we um we looked at different amounts of mycotized millet so that this is this is a so mortality is on on the on the x-axis in percent so we, we reach something like 80% mortality. <clears throat> and then on the on the y-axis is the treatment, right? So we have a treatment that says millet 15 grams. And so this tiny, tiny spike that you might see there is, is the mortality of, of millet when it's not mycotized. 
So it's actually food. So they, they did really well in, in, in that millet. Uh, then millet that's mycotized is the next is the next one over. So this one here. So we reach in something like 75 to 80% of mortality for uh, over four weeks uh, with this mycotized millet. Mycotized millet. When we use 25 grams, uh, we have a little bit more mortality in the millet that didn't have the Bovaria bassiana grown on it. Uh, but again, with 25 grams, we also get something like 70 to 80% mortality for that mycotized millet. And then if you we don't have any millet, uh, then uh, the first the first spike right here is just Bovaria bassiana that we that we sprinkled on onto the uh, onto the worms directly. Um, and uh, this one here is no millet, uh, no millet and no Bovaria bassiana. Um, so uh, Bovaria bassiana uh, is uh, is cultured from from Botanigard, which is the commercial product um, in this case. So really good effects on on the on the worms. Uh, we tried some other things. Um, there, there's a there's a study ongoing right now with uh, sodium lauryl sulfate uh, and and a couple of other things. I'll talk about that in a minute. But we tried we tried uh, you know the millet treatment here, um, and you get sixty percent. Uh, this these are these are really old worms, so they they are they're bigger, they are less, they're more difficult to kill. So we get about sixty percent mortality um, if we use and and we don't get any any plant death at all. So this is not just about the mortality of the worms, but also mortality and and damage to the plants. So this white area here indicates that there's no plant damage. When we use soap, uh, so this is Meyer's uh, dish soap, <clears throat> then uh, a different concentration. So five mils, hundred mils, and and twenty mils in uh, in a in a gallon. Uh, then we get something somewhere in between this mortality. Uh, which is low to that to the mortality, that the higher mortality here, uh, but we also have slowed plant growth. So the 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 soaps tend to slow uh, plant growth quite a bit. Uh, and then we used vinegar, um, this regular vinegar, uh, at uh, different concentrations, and that killed the plants. But it also killed the worms really well. So you know, if you, if you want to kill the worms and you don't care about the plants, then that is the way to go. Uh, but uh, most most people like to keep their their plants alive as well. Okay, so uh, on the eradicate there's there's different mechanisms by which uh, the um, the um, pesticide act uh, has provisions to allow potentially allow the the use of pesticides without without that the organisms have to be on the label. And so there is um, we there's this thing called this this uh, paragraph in 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 the act that says uh, that has a list of minimal risk active and inactive ingredients. Um, and so those are minimal risk and in some states you are allowed to use them without too much of a problem. Um, I see a hand. Okay, so yeah, anyway, so minimal risk list. Um, uh, sodium lauryl sulfate is on there, cedar wood is on there, there's cedar wood oil is on there, and some other things. Um, and so SLS, so the cedar, sodium lauryl sulfate is, uh, is, is as effective as tea tree seed extract. But in Vermont, uh, this, this has to be approved. In other states, it doesn't because it's on the list. So it depends on your state. So you need to talk to you, your Department of Ag Agriculture or whoever is regulating pesticides in your state in order to find out whether you can use any of those things. Um, uh, you can also try a multi-stressor approach that you, you, do, you might use some kind of pesticide that will in the future maybe be allowed for use on, on jumping worms. Uh, and maybe also solarization at the same time. So maybe, or you use Bovaria bassiana, uh, and uh, and you try to uh, um, solarize or do something else, or or 
um, till, till your soil. So this is the other thing, utility of tillage, right? So there's some hypotheses about this. So the trouble that we see with castings is that small plants uh, don't seed in, in the castings and may not grow very well. Uh, the castings might cause drought. Um, and there might be also an, uh, a thermal insulation for the worms to they can crawl under underneath the castings and be protected from big swings in temperature, for example. Right. So that that is the the soup part of the trouble of the castings. Um, so tillage, if you till those in, then uh, you are probably avoiding some of this 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 problem. Um, uh, it also, tillage also destroys the habitat of the worm uh, and uh, in, incorporates the castings that are likely likely actually are pretty high in. They are actually high in, in, in nutrients. So by incorporating them, uh, you probably get some benefits out of that. Uh, eradication, again, you can try and trap them. So uh, wood discs work pretty well for, for attracting them. Um, cantaloupes are pretty good. So I hear um, tarps and transparent plastic, wood planks, anything where you've seen in your garden that, that uh, earthworms um, collect under might be good places to uh, to find them or, and to trap them. Uh, and I'm going to go a little faster through this. So other in interventions. So Mariam uh, isolated some agents that that uh, that did this. So they had really, really high um, um, mortalities, mortality rates like uh, penicillin, penicillium, the fungus itself had a 100% rating after uh, 240 hours of exposure. Bacillus, the same. Uh, Staphylococcus, a little bit lower. Uh, but then again, you, you don't necessarily want to try anything that also might affect your health. So we don't you, we don't really want to do that. Uh, ants can be uh, anti-worm. Uh, American woodcock is a predator of worms. Uh, and then there's there's the hammerhead worm that, that is now starting to spread. It's also an invasive species. That uh, that specializes on on earthworms and other soft shell, uh, soft skinned things. Uh, there's parasites as well uh, that that get into the worms, but they don't seem to do much really uh, to um, uh, to bring down the numbers. They seem to the worms seem to survive long enough to to create a lot of cocoons. So one good thing that's happening is that uh, we put together. A consortium of uh, several universities that are looking that will be looking at jumping worms in the future together, um, and uh, so this is to we have we will have a web page that has a lot of resources in them and a mechanism to for research funding, um, and uh, we'll keep that up to date with with uh, with the latest news and the latest and bestest uh, thoughts on on control uh, and and jumping worm science. So with that, I uh, I invite questions, but I'd like to uh, acknowledge first uh, three anonymous donors that really have uh, have funded this research for the past mm -hmm. three years really well with you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, the Hardy Plant Club, uh, UVM Agricultural Experiment Station, Epley Foundation, and the Vermont Agency of Agriculture. And yeah, questions. Yes, we have lots of questions. Uh, um, no, I thought I answered them all. <laughs> no. Uh, could you review, um, also, I guess, uh, Vanessa turned on the thumbs up approach. So if you if you read questions, you members in the audience, remember your questions are going in the Q&A, not the chat. You can okay. give it the thumbs up if you really thought that was an important question. But one of the first common questions um, is, could you repeat the information about how deep the jumping worms go and also, how deep the cocoons are likely to be? Yeah, so I think that jumping, ordinarily jumping worms don't, if there's enough resource at the surface, they will not go down more than two inches. Um, but I had an interesting experience about three years ago, and uh, the the uh, experience was I, I made myself some, um, some fermented compost, bokashi, uh, and bokashi has to be, in order for it, for it to work, has to be uh, buried and has to, should be buried at about uh, a foot to two feet down, depending how 
how active you want to be. Uh, I I put it at at about eighteen inches deep, and I planted my potatoes just above that. And when I when I dug the potatoes, uh, right in that layer at eighteen inches, there was jumping worms because they found it and they liked it, so they they were there. Uh, but in in regular gardens, I wouldn't think that you you would see them more than two inches below the surface. And what People, would be a typical diameter of a cocoon? Uh, so three, so anything between uh, two and four millimeters, which is anything between a twelfth and a and a sixth of an inch. Um, is it safe to feed the jumping worms to birds? Uh, good question. So jumping worms are, are accumulators of heavy metals. Um, and depending on, on where you find the jumping worms and whether you have um, heavy metals in your soil, uh, I don't see a reason why you should. I mean, I don't see a reason. If you, if you don't have any metals in your soil, then I don't see a reason why that wouldn't be. And, and there, are actually, there are actually some people in... Uh, in the composting industry that 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 have uh that have used that method to to get rid of of worms um yeah so it, it i think it's safe as long as your as long as your soil is is safe uh, what about if you have plant plugs or you buy uh plants from someplace in pots should you take them out of the pot and soak them in the water uh before you plant them uh, if you put the pots in the water, will the jumping worms come up to the surface? Not necessarily. Um, I think the better way to do this is to to wash the roots. Uh, so to get rid of the soil that's on, run, on the roots, that would also get rid of the jumping worms and the cocoons, and then um, then plant then plant uh, this then plant the plant back into clean potting mix. So if you buy a sterilized mix, uh, that should be totally fine. Um, uh, and then the, the question is what what you do with the with the soil that you just washed washed off the thing. I think you you let you let it settle in the water. Then you then you slowly after a few days you kind of pour off the the water that's that's clean at the top, um, and put the soil into uh, a a plastic Ziploc bag or something big enough to hold the soil and put it in the sun. That should kill, should kill the worms. Then we we have some very creative people. Um, they want to know okay. if they if they've bought bagged compost or mulch, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not clear plastic. What happens if they just can they just put that out in the sun and and let it cook right in the bag before they put it on the garden? Yeah, I think that would work. Uh, there's two things to to worry about. Um, and the main the main thing and this is probably the only thing I should really mention is that you need to have some clearance between between the soil and the bag, right? So you can either um, do if if you have a uh, not even a, so yeah put put some kind of thermal insulator between the soil or the driveway and and the bag, uh, and that then leave it in the sun for a couple of days. That should do it. And th this is even more creative on the same theme. If you if you went to the store and you bought your bag compost or your bag soil, what about if you just leave it in your car on a sunny day where it gets really hot? Yeah, uh, if it kills the dog, it should kill the worms, right? So <laughs> um, maybe uh, I. That's a really good question because it, even though it seems that we're reaching like ninety degrees in the car. I'm not sure whether that is true for the inside of the bag, unless you leave it in there for a long time. I would still take it out and and maybe you can put it on top of the car, maybe and uh, in the sun, and that might that might work better. I I really don't want to say. So my my, my gut feeling is, well, yeah, that'll work. But I guess you a, could put a soil thermometer in there and see. You could do that. Yes. Yeah. For sure. Um, One of those composting thermometers, yes. Yeah. What about boiling water? If you pour pour boiling water in a bucket with the worms, will that kill them? Um, I would probably use soapy water. Uh, so I I would say boiling water, handling boiling water in in a garden uh, is 
as you will know, as a former safety officer at the University of Rhode Island, you'll know that that might that might cause a, cause cause a problem, right? You, you might spill it and it runs over your foot, and then you have a have a foot in in ice for a couple of days. Uh, one person here um, says that they they work on projects where they're clearing trails and, mm -hmm. of invasive plants, and if they see jumping worms. Um, what would happen if they just break the worms in half? Do they reproduce, um, or will that? No. So, so if if you if you go to that length, uh, there's a horticulture uh, a nursery worker that that squishes their heads with a between thumb and index finger. I think that's hmm, gross, but um, but it can be done. And I don't think it depends depends where you where you break it like so if you break it really close to the clitellum then uh that worm is probably dead right so they they haven't have an escape mechanism by which they they actually uh amputate their own their own uh their own tail so depending where you break it so if if the the tail is if they break off the tail then the front end will live so depending on where you break break the worm so if you break the worm close to the clitellum then the worm is probably going to die. If you do it too far back, then uh, that worm will regenerate. On, only the front end, not the back end. Only one one part will live. Okay, I'm going to only pick about uh, five more minutes of questions. We have we have a couple hundred questions, so I'm just going to do a couple here. So, um, do you think what about jumping worms uh, using a straw as a mulch as opposed to wood chips? or compost, um, does the type of mulch make any difference? Do the jumping worms have a preference? Um, well, we did some experiment with wood chips and they definitely liked wood chips. Uh, in fact, uh, that's how I got started on jumping worms. My garden, I had a really thick layer of, of wood chips, uh, wood chip mulch, and uh, that that the, the folks that were selling the house put out in May and by August it was gone, I had jumping worms. So, uh, they like wood chips, so I don't think it makes much of a difference uh, what kind of organic material you have. It's all food for them. So somebody wanted what, wanted you to repeat. Did you say that the hammerhead worms are eating the jumping worms? Uh, the hammerhead worms have have caused havoc in in the borderlands of the UK, so the land the, the area between Scotland and and uh, and England, uh, where they have decimated the. Uh, the native earthworm fauna, and so they they are known to go after earthworms. Uh, the the European earthworms are like docile; they're slow and they're easy easy prey for the for the uh, hammerhead worms. Uh, some people say that the hammerhead worms are just not fast enough to to keep up with the uh, more active uh, Japanese worms. Uh, in Japan. Uh, are there natural predators and are there, did the Japanese people have just different type of forests so that um, the yeah. effects in our, and, and is there a difference between in the U.S. between hardwood forests and, and, uh, ever, and uh, evergreen forests? Yes. Yeah, so uh, evergreen forests are probably less likely to be invaded unless there is a, unless there's any kind of broadleaf uh, mixed in, right? So as soon as you have some broadleaf, trees in there you you have uh, you can have you, you may have jumping worms but a purely um, coniferous forest is less likely to be invaded uh, in Japan uh, there's the people that that we worked with in Japan basically say well uh, bamboo is not a place for them uh, you, you don't look in bamboo because you don't find any uh, and then evergreen evergreen oak may, may also not be a place uh, for them to where you find them. In fact, we found very few of of the worms that we are we are working with here in, in here in Vermont in Japan. We had to go to the roadside to uh, roadside ditches to find them. Uh, they, you couldn't find them in the woodlands. And one reason for that might be might be the 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 quality of of the leaf litter, the quality of the litter in in the forests. Uh, the other another reason might be there's a lot more jumping worm like creatures there, so more more jumping worms, uh, different species that might compete with the ones that we have here, uh, and um, 
Yeah, there was very, very few in the, I mean, we didn't, we didn't find a single one in the forest, but we know there were, were there, but just in very small numbers. Uh, are there predators? Probably. Uh, and, you know, we don't know. Okay, a few people wanted to know, they've heard maybe tea seed meal is useful. Um, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, tea, tea tree seed meal is uh, is this gold standard for for killing earthworms. So you can you can that would would work. Uh, but tea tree seed meal is also not uh, if you use it as a pesticide, it is not uh, it doesn't have a label uh, for for that. So you shouldn't really use it until somebody puts a label on there that says how it is safe to use because tea tree seed meal also has effects on aquatic fauna. So if you're near a stream or something like that, and you have a big runoff event, and you get the tea tree seed meal get into, into the stream, then uh, that might cause environmental havoc as well. Just different kind. So you want, you want, you want to, our job is to find, to find something that's safe to use, right? So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> And at the moment, we can't really say that tea tree seed meal is is safe safe in in all under all circumstances. Uh, maybe you would have an opinion, Vanessa or Joseph, about this question. Do cooperative extensions uh, usually have someone who could identify jumping worms or distinguish between earthworms and jumping worms? Yeah, the the hotline here in Vermont. Uh, I, I I do a training every year, uh, and so they're pretty good at 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 that. Uh, sometimes I I will get uh, referrals from them, uh, but it's not that not there's not as many referrals as there's questions. So uh, I at least in 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 uh, in Vermont that seems to work pretty well. I think I would suggest um, as a first approach to take a photograph with your camera and email that to your cooperative extension. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I think yes. I think that would be helpful. And then if they didn't have the answer, they could refer it to their local uh, specialist. Yeah, and that's that's the best way to go. Make sure that it's a sharp image, that the image is uh, is taken, that you, you take an image of the underside and the top side of the worm uh, to see whether the clitellum goes all the way around. Um, yeah, I think that's that's that. And that's what a lot of people do. They, they will send send image. And oftentimes we ask for images, photos um, of so, worms. So I would just say that this this um, session is being recorded, and in about a week or two, the recording will be available. We can um, probably email the link out to the participants if that would be helpful. Um, just I'm just going to do maybe three more questions. One was a follow up on the bird question: Can you feed jumping worms to chickens? And does all soil have heavy metals that would be bad for the chickens? Um, good question. I mean, you would have to have a soil test done. That that is, and again, you can contact your corporate corporate extension office uh, because uh, they're usually the ones that can facilitate the soil tests. Um, you would want to know whether your soil is impacted by heavy metals, uh, but people do it. Uh, as I said, there's a commercial commercial. Uh, Composter who sells eggs, uh, where uh, earthworms are uh, not just jumping ones, but in, the, in that case, uh, earthworms are being fed to the chickens. All um, earthworms are good at. at I, I think this will be the, la the last question. Um, the castings lock up nutrients and prevent uh, the association with the soil fungus. How long does it take for the castings to break down, and does tilling? cause them to break down more quickly? I think tilling will make them, co uh, will cause them to break down quick, more quickly. It's ag agitating them and taking them back into, into the soil itself. <clears throat> I think that that will probably be a, a really good, uh, a good thing to do. Again, we haven't done that experiment yet. Uh, again, it's all a question of money. And, uh, and so the, the, but we, we, we hope to, to get, people to uh, some other people in the extension service to to look at this because now some commercial growers are impacted. And so that that is usually a, a thing where the extension service can go in and, and do some experimentation. Um, we, we, 
I'm sorry. Some of these questions are so intriguing. I said I was only going to do two more, but keep here, going. Here's another one. If if a person has a, a raised bed, um, what would happen if they heated the soil with a weed torch before they planted? Uh, probably not much because uh, the the there have been experiments where uh, people uh, burnt. Uh, they burnt the soil and uh, the earthworms survived. They only have to go about two inches down uh, for that temperature to re the temperature of about 500 degrees Celsius to be reduced to something like 30 degrees Celsius. Um, soil is a really good insulator. I wouldn't do it for two reasons. One, it doesn't work. And two, it's dangerous. So, uh, I mean, maybe maybe you feel you're, you're safe there, but all sorts of, all sorts of things can happen with a torch. Um, also, are you aware of any, this, this is the last question. Um, are there references that you've seen about what are the best, once you remove the jumping worms, what's the best way to rehabilitate the soil? Would that well, be a I, soil I think, test or, or what? I think the best way to re rehabilit re rehabilitate the soil is, is to, uh, to use cover crops. So, uh, put, put, Put down some um, some cover crops, maybe some some clover and or alfalfa and and some grain that you incorporate into the soil after in in the springtime to uh, to increase the organic matter and nitrogen content um, and do that several times. Uh, I think that would be a really good way to go to build the organic matter back up. Um, uh, use some clean compost to to if you are if you have a high tunnel uh, sorry if you have a raised bed. Uh, use some clean compost to maybe re rehabilitate the soil that way, uh, bring more organic matter in. Uh, don't overdo it with the organic matter. That's not necessarily the best way to go, but uh, you know, try and build it up back to 7% or something. Um, well, thank you, Joseph. I, it is now almost quarter to nine, so I think we're going to end this now. Um, we do really appreciate uh, many people are saying thank you for your very informative talk and uh, we look forward in the future perhaps to um, getting a handout that we can share with the folks and yeah I, I, I will actually send you one um, I had I had a busy day when, today when, it, when it's convenient and I'll just end with one one comment from someone who says jumping worms and lantern flies is there any hope for us gardeners oh yeah always hope I'm the hope I'm the the very the very re the very fact that you are gardening that should give you hope and 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 joy. So uh, even even though we hate the jumping worms in our gardens, don't let them get the better of you. Well, that that's a lovely thought, and thank you, Joseph, uh, very much. I'm going to end this uh, talk for everyone now. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs>